Hello, watch enthusiasts. Now, if any watch in the world has a reputation for, for its, uh, its exploits, then it must be the Omega Speedmaster. This watch has been able to resist such enormous feats, such as going into space, being used for racing, and indeed simply as an aviation chronograph, for really every purpose that uh, one could possibly imagine. This is a remarkable piece of engineering. But in truth, its most, uh, most well-known exploits are those in space, and indeed on the moon. And so today I'd like to speak about the history of this watch in relation to seven versions of it which defined its position as the Moon Watch. And of course there have been a great deal of different Speedmasters taken into space, but really there are seven which in my eyes stand out as being the most important both technologically to the Speedmaster, but also the most important ones to history where the Speedmaster and indeed the Space and uh, Moon missions were concerned. However, the start of this story doesn't begin with the Speedmaster at all, but rather with the early days of NASA's spaceflight. And this comes on the 3rd of October 1962, when they launched Mercury Atlas 8 with the Sigma 7 craft. And this was a, a mission that was just an, a continual um, version of their, their continued works with the Mercury Atlas program. But this was a mission which was designed to, to evaluate how long someone could stay in space, and whether extended sp space flights were going to be possible. And this was rather a short mission, only lasting about nine hours but nonetheless prove a great deal about how long, um, how long an individual could stay in space and manage three orbits in low Earth orbit. Crucially though to the story of the Omega Speedmaster in space, the astronaut who went up with this mission was Wally Shira. And the interesting factor about him was that he wore an Omega Speedmaster personally, and I'll speak more about the exact reference in a moment. Because the, the importance of this was the fact that the Omega Speedmaster, nor any other chronograph, was NASA certified to be used in space, and so as a result, astronauts were wearing their own watches um, whilst they were, uh, they, they were undertaking their missions. But at this point, and by about 1964, NASA had realised that they really needed to have a watch which was certified, and which would, uh, would be able to keep time as per their specifications. And the reason for this was that it simply wasn't safe to have astronauts using their own watches, um, instead of using um, any other sort of uh, NASA-approved technology, just for the sake of accuracy and the risks of their watches not being up to standard. Now the version of the Speedmaster which was used in this particular mission was the Speedmaster CK2998. And this version of the Speedmaster was in fact released several years earlier in 1959 and was the follow-up to the 1957 release of the very first of the Omega Speedmasters, the CK2915. And this watch was in many ways very different to a modern Speedmaster professional. Like the original Speedmaster from 1957, it featured a straight style of, of lug with these bevels down the edge. And also it featured a smaller size, because this watch was, uh, was a full 40mm instead of the 42mm of a professional, with its, uh, its bezel. Likewise, its crown and pushers were exposed and unprotected from the elements, but nonetheless were, uh, were important in the sense that they were, um, they were a real breakthrough for Omega, because this was the first reference of Speedmaster which featured O-rings around the pushers, thus giving the watch a certain watch resistance. Aside from that change, the rest of the case appeared very, very similar to the original CK2915. The only really easily distinguished element on the case was the fact that the bezel was now thicker, and also featured a black aluminium insert. And this was a problem with the original, the insert was very difficult to read as a result of simply being brushed steel, and so they rectified that situation with this reference. The dial though appears quite profoundly changed, pr primarily because of the use of hands. And these hands came really with, uh, with one style in this particular reference, and these were alpha style hands. These were these beautiful lance-style hands with a luminous centre and with, uh, with a, uh, a polished metal surface. These were also mirrored on the subdials, which, uh, which similarly featured these, um, these styles of, of alpha hands, although on some versions one does see straight hands, but these are generally uh, later, later models. One other change was also the fact that the second hand came with, in some cases for military pilots, a, a luminous dot or pip on it. And this meant that it was more easily used in the dark and gave the watch a certain functionality, though it's not believed that the vast majority of these watches came with this adjustment. Another real beauty of this watch is the fact that it has the Applied Omega logo, which lends real contrast to the dial, and also has the old-fashioned style of Omega sign dial, with Speedmaster underneath, and notably no professional, because this was before the Speedmaster professional as a designation. And inside the watch there was the Calibre 321, which is the legendary manually wound chronograph calibre from Omega. And it should really be noted that this movement didn't run at a modern high beat rate, instead it ran at 18,000 vibrations per hour, which is very standard for the period and was, was 4 ticks a second. And admittedly this is, this is lower than we would expect today, but the way these movements were put together and the way they were designed with their column wheel, uh, 
really has become the stuff of legends as some of the best movements of their period, in terms of the quality of the movement, and the care taken to really build a movement designed to last. Now, bearing in mind the fact that at this stage, Omega hadn't been approached by NASA, they continued to produce two new references of the Speedmaster, each time being an improvement. And the first of these um, was the 1962 release of the 105.002, but for the purposes of this video, the really important one was the 105.003 of 1963. Now, for the sake of reference, and just to point this element out, the only major difference between the 105.002 and the 105.003 was the diameter of the bezel. Because on the, the earlier model, the bezel was 38.6mm in diameter, whilst on the later version it rose to 39.7mm, being the size which was uh, ultimately chosen by Omega as the, the size of a Speedmaster bezel, and to the present day models such as the first Omega in space still feature this size of bezel. However, this did also feature one change to the CK2998 model, which, uh, which was seen in the bezel. And this was seen in the bezel insert, because now one sees a bezel insert graduated from 500 to 60. But really, the key change here was in the dial. Because the dial now featured this stepped style, with a centre which was raised, with this, uh, this still black form, and of course without professional written on it. But crucially, the hands changed, because these set the, the, the precedent for all later Speedmaster professionals because now they featured these Batten-style minutes and hours, as well as the subdials. These were painted white as well for higher contrast and legibility, and were fully luminous down their length. One also saw on all these versions um, a second hand, which now featured this large teardrop shape of, uh, of luminous cutout, and this allowed them to be more legible, but also to take on that quintessential Speedmaster profile. This generation of Speedmaster was also crucial to the development of the line, on the basis that this now proved to be a very different watch to the purely racing-inspired predecessors. And admittedly, these, uh, these aren't seen very often, but this, in my eyes, will be down to the choice of bezels. Because in addition to the tachymeter, which featured that new, new redesigned style going up to 500, they also offered a pulsometer bezel to be able to measure your pulse, a telemeter bezel to be able to measure distance um, based, upon, uh, based upon the difference between light and sound, in addition to a decimal bezel, which is perhaps the most misunderstood. But these are probably some of the most interesting, because they allow you to, uh, to break down the minute, or indeed the hour, into uh, a decimal number, and so as a result will make calculations much easier for astronauts in the, in the long run, but simply anyone using the watch uh, when the watch was originally released. But the reason why this watch plays such a key role in the story is because this was the watch which was selected by NASA to be tested for their space program. Because by 1964, they really had realised they needed a watch to be uh, to be certified by them, but, and, and indeed uh, capable of surviving the rigours and the difficulties of space. And so they, they approached a number of brands, um, and indeed bought from their brands, as opposed to having, having models sent in. And these pieces were, uh, were ultimately from Longines, uh, Wittenauer, Rolex, and of course Omega. In order to establish how suitable each of these watches were to the, the, the tasks in space, they were run through a set of extremely rigorous tests, which I'll go through now. So they tested the watches with temperature, being the high temperature tests, which ran them for 48 hours at 71 degrees C, and then for 30 minutes up to 93 degrees C. They also ran low temperature tests, where they spent 4 hours at 0 degrees, and they would also run them through cycles of temperatures in a near vacuum, from 71 degrees um, for 45 minutes to 0 degrees for 45 minutes, 15 times in succession. They would also test them um, against uh, humidity, spending 250 hours at 95% humidity between 20 degrees and 71 degrees C. They were also tested within oxygen at a, uh, a pressure of uh, 0.35 atmospheres at 71 degrees for 48 hours, and then they were subjected to 6 40G shocks from different angles, and accelerated from 1 to 7.25 Gs in 333 seconds. Crucially for space, they were tested at low pressure, being run for 90 minutes um, at uh, 10 to the minus 6 atmospheres at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is again 71 degrees C, followed by 30 minutes at 93 degrees C. Believe it or not, the tests continued then after that, being run at high pressure at 1.6 atmospheres for one hour. Then these were also subjected to vibrations, running in, uh, in three cycles of 30 minutes, with vibrations varying from 5 hertz to 2000 hertz, and they were also um, tested against noise, which is not something you would immediately expect to test against, but of course being a vibration they would have to, being run at 30 minutes to 130 decibels, from 40 to 10,000 hertz. And so after being run through these tests, it was shown that the Omega was the only watch able to survive these with a satisfactory result, 
And bearing in mind the fact that this watch was able to resist these temperature changes, and also these various other tests, with a very minor variation in its accuracy, it's quite remarkable, bearing in mind also that oils were not what they are today, and so the temperature changes would have uh, very crucially affected the oils within the watch, making it clear that these movements really were very robust and extremely well conceived. Of course, NASA had greater ambitions, though, than spending short periods of time in space. Because in the early 60s, JFK famously stated that they would reach the moon before the end of the decade. And this was also, uh, also uh, helped by the fact that the Russians and the USSR had been able to put Yuri Gagarin in space before America's astronauts. And so as a result, it was important for this next milestone to be that of NASA. And so they set to work throughout the 1960s to achieve this aim. And so when, uh, when Apollo 11 launched on the 16th of July 1969, it really was crucial that this was a successful mission. And the mission lasted until the 24th of July, and in between these two dates they landed on the moon and stayed there for 21 and a half hours. And of course this was a very major moment for, for, uh, for, for astronauts in general, and has gone down in history as one of these, these truly incredible moments. But nonetheless, it's the watches in this video that we're interested in, because they used the first Speedmaster Professionals in, uh, in this mission. And the first Speedmaster Professional was the ST105.012, which was the watch worn by both uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, whilst Michael Collins, who remained in the, uh, the service module in orbit of the moon, had the later reference 145.012. And for many people, what the Speedmaster reference ST105.012 is, which was in fact released in 1963, was that this watch was was very much a, a 105 uh, with that slim case, but put into this new professional case. And that's seen in the fact that this watch now has professional on the dial. And this marks a real change for the Speedmaster and created a, a very different line of watches, with these more resilient lyre style lugs, where one had brushed elements on the top, then a beautiful polished bevel, and then brushing again on the side of the watch. Likewise, one had to have the same Omega logo applied to the dial, and the same hands as well, which featured the more delicate style of, uh, of second hand, as opposed to later triangular hands, with a great deal more heft and the 70s sort of vibe, whereas this watch really was a creation of the 1960s. Internally, the watch also continued to use the, uh, the, the, the movement 321 from Omega, despite the fact that the case had now grown to, to, uh, to 42mm, and there was no longer any overhang from that bezel. These cases also featured one great benefit, which was that apart from protecting the crown and the pushers, they also had a new style of rubber membrane inside them to create a greater degree of water resistance, which was again an important element, bearing in mind the fact that these watches were designed to be subjected to the very toughest of environments. Now, there was also a second version, as I mentioned, the ST145.012, and this was just an extension of the line and a, a continuation in the, uh, the design of this watch as the professional. And it should be noted this watch also still contained the 321 calibre, and that was released in 1966, and that was the watch which was worn by, by Michael Collins, and so both of these watches were in active use by NASA. Of course, nowadays these pieces are regarded as some of the most collectible and desirable models of the Speedmaster Professional range. Of course, these are very much the genesis moment, these are the beginning of a line which has spanned the decades very, very successfully, with very few changes to the core models in the range in terms of their general concept and design. But I feel one has to remember that these watches were designed purely to be tools in the period, and as such fulfilled the role extremely well with those high contrast hands on the black dial. The tachymeter of course was no longer really of much use in space, but now with a more robust case. And so it's interesting to see how the Speedmaster developed by necessity, as opposed to by design, which is so often the driving factor nowadays. One quirk of history though, is that really these shouldn't have been worn by the, uh, the Apollo 11 crew. And the reason why I say that is because NASA, theoretically, should have upgraded by this point to, to, uh, to Omega's most recent version of the Speedmaster Professional, which was of course the reference ST145.022. And whilst this watch isn't one of the seven pieces which are important in this video, as it well, wasn't used in the early moon landings, I think it still should be mentioned because in Myers it's the first true Speedmaster Professional. This is no longer a transitional reference, it now has the, the, the full Omega uh, uh, reinforced and widened triangular second hand, in addition to the fact that these started featuring dials with a painted Omega logo instead of the applied one. But most crucially, the movement was different, because they now use the Calibre 861. And the 861 had a few objectives, but the most important of these was to be a bit more accurate in terms of the, uh, the high beat rate of the movement, but also to be a lower cost movement. And so the changes they made were the fact that the whole movement was more simple, the, the movement itself um, worked with a, a cam-actuated chronograph instead of a column wheel. And without going into the technology of this, this really means that the chronograph doesn't have quite as sharp a start or stop, but does tend to be more, uh, more reliable. 
Then there was also the element of the, the second-hand break, and previously these had been metal, but in this case they used delrin, which was a, a type of, of uh, polymer, or a type of composite, which was designed to, uh, to, to reduce the friction on the movement and extend the service life, although um, the effect of this really was to reduce the value of the watch, because collectors nowadays tend to, uh, to look down upon this change. The one other change was the rise in beat rate from 18,000 vibrations per hour, or 4 ticks a second, to 6 ticks a second at 21,600 vibrations per hour. However, as fate would have it, this watch wasn't used during these early moon landings. Instead, they used the earlier 321 caliber references. And so really, the 321s had one very major moment during the famous Apollo 13. Of course, the story of Apollo 13 has become extremely well known thanks to the film, but also a number of, uh, of pieces of writing about it. But the general story was that on their, their journey to the moon, which was two days in to their, their trip, which was April the 14th, 1970, there was a, a quite major accident um, on the, uh, the service module. And the service module is the, the rocket which essentially moves the, uh, the, the, um, the, mains, uh, the main crew capsule, which also re-enters the atmosphere on their way home, and which orbits the, uh, the moon. And this is an essential part to the mission because it directs them around when they're in space. But there was a, a large explosion of an oxygen tank which blew out the side of the module and resulted in a very dangerous situation, and also uh, resulted in the, uh, the whole uh, craft being misaligned on the way back to Earth. And so, as a result of this, they were 60 to 80 nautical miles off course, and so they had to time a, a burn um, of their, uh, their engine to be able to realign themselves. However, the problem was that uh, in order to, to save energy, because they were using the, the lunar module as, as living, uh, living accommodation during this time, which was only designed to support two astronauts for, um, uh, for, for effectively two days, whereas now they had to last four days with three astronauts. And so what they tried to do was to economise power. And so due to that, they had to turn the clock off and also the cabin heating. And the result of this was they had to use their speedmasters to time the 14 second burn, which ultimately realigned the module and allowed them to, to return home safely. Which of course has created a great deal of cult following around the speedmaster as such an important piece of equipment. Of course, whilst the Apollo speedmasters will always be the most remembered, I feel the 1970s and the late 1960s showed a period of really impressive innovation for Omega with their Alaska project. And this was a series of watches produced for NASA as the, the future of the Omega Speedmaster as a, a space watch. And the crucial aspect about these was they weren't designed um, to, to follow the lines of their production models. These had very wacky uh, designs and, uh, and considerations taken to make them more suitable for a space environment. And I'm a great advocate of 70s Speedmasters, I think they offer incredible value if you buy one, but also are, are very interesting historically and I think are undervalued, and mind you, I do say that wearing an Omega Speedmaster Mark III on a, a NASA-style Velcro strap, so I am perhaps a little bit biased. But the first of these watches came out really in 1967 and, uh, and was, uh, was um, really in tests um, through the whole of the late, late 1960s. And so of course this watch was the first Alaska Project Speedmaster. And this piece was designed really with a great deal of considerations taken to being used on Apollo 18 and Apollo 20. And this watch was conceived to be about as robust as Speedmaster could be, and to give the, the maximum legibility to this watch, as well as resilient to, to, uh, to the elements. And most crucially, this watch featured the calibre 861, as I mentioned, in those, um, those later 1968 Speedmasters. But the general case design was probably the most interesting because it was a world first in terms of having a titanium case, which was both very light but also very heat resistant and very strong, which were all elements very very much needed for this watch, which uh, which which allowed it to be more and more uh, more suited to the space environment than the conventional steel case. And this was also a, a clear tonneau style of case with uh, with no no sharp edges to create a, a a sort of a form that wouldn't snag on anything if it were to to bump against things, which undoubtedly it would, bearing in mind that it was quite large. Now, the case around that, though, was this large metal um, style of, of aluminium clamshell case. And the purpose of this, again, was heat resistance, because it was, it was extremely resilient to, um, uh, to, to radiation. It was also quartz-coated, and, and they found that red was the correct colour for this, um, this particular type of shroud to be able to protect it from the elements. And this snapped closed around the case, and so you couldn't adjust the time through it, rather you had to pop it open to do so. But there were very large pushes which were integrated into it as well, which would be easier to use with gloves on. The dial on this watch was also completely redesigned, because as you can see it was no longer black. Instead they went for this silver colour, which was also an element to, to reflect heat, as a result of its, uh, its coloration and its, uh, its surface texture. 
They also dropped the use of attacker meter because really in space that's of no use, but instead increased the size of the second markings around the edge of the dial, and also removed clutter from the internal dial with these applied indices with a contrasting colour. The hands also contrasted the dial in black, and one had these very large red hands with this, uh, this lower triangle for the, um, the chronograph functions, as well as the, the red chronograph second hand, whereas the rest was in black to create this, this visual division and a greater legibility for the, the user. Now, where use was concerned, it's not believed that these watches were ever worn by NASA astronauts as a result of Apollo 18 and Apollo 20 being cancelled, which resulted in only a few prototypes being made. However, some have speculated that these watches may have been worn by the 1977 crew of Soyuz 5 from Russia. And whilst this seems difficult to believe, one certainly can believe it having uh, seen the, the photographs of, of very large red round cases on their wrists in photographs. And of course, there's no, um, there's no proof of any of this, but uh, it's an interesting concept and something quite interesting to look into. Now, whereas the original Alaska project was produced between 1967 and 1969, whilst it was eventually cancelled in 1971, the Alaska 2 was, uh, was produced from 1972, and this remained very much a prototype and something which was tested by NASA in order to, uh, to, to, to establish whether it was worthwhile as a change to the original Speedmaster. And the Alaska Project 2 was a very different watch to the original. It now featured a conventional style of, of Speedmaster case, except in this, uh, in this particular instance it was matted in order to reduce the glare of, uh, of the bright and very sharp sunlight you get in space. One should also notice, though, that there, there has also been a change to the bezel. And whereas some Alaska Project models with white dials which were produced featured a far more conservative style of tachymeter, the most extreme versions of the Alaska 2 featured this 5-minute uh, this graduated bezel, which is also much, much thicker than a conventional bezel in order to fully protect the crystal from the elements, as opposed to the normal one where the crystal would appear protruding from the front of the watch, and thus was, was uh, susceptible to knocks and bangs. With that being said, though, the most striking detail about this watch is the dial. And whereas various other versions from the Alaska Project, which uh, have come up at auction, for example, haven't featured this style of dial, this is generally accepted as the, uh, the Alaska Project dial, in its most pure form. And so this watch featured this stepped silver dial, albeit less silver than its predecessor, but now with these, uh, these very characteristic subdials. And they feature these, uh, these full Arabic numerals around their edge, at uh, every, um, every interval, so you see every 5 minutes for the 30 minute counter, every hour for the 12 hour counter, and every 10 seconds for the, um, the, 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 the second counter. And these are also matched by these rocket shaped hands, which are more legible at a glance, and also are luminescent unlike other Speedmaster iterations, whilst they also kept red on the second hand to aid legibility. Unfortunately, as with the Speedmaster Mark II, which was, uh, was famously designed by Omega to follow up the conventional Speedmaster Professional, this watch wasn't accepted by NASA and, and wasn't used, um, at least in, uh, in any sort of large scale, nor was it used on, on any notable missions. And I think this is rather a shame, bearing in mind the fact that uh, Omega had really made an effort to create something which was meant to be the ideal space watch, where the original Speedmaster really wasn't designed to be put in space. It was designed, at core, to be a racing watch, hence the tachymeter. But nonetheless, this, um, this, this uh, aptitude for creating extremely accurate products certainly did put Omega in good stead with NASA. This final piece I'd like to speak about is quite possibly Omega's final attempt at creating a mechanical option in this, uh, this unique form for the space program as the ideal space watch. And this was the Project 3 from the Alaska Project. And this piece in many ways is the most conservative. In many ways it appears much like uh, the, the existing um, reference 145.022. And in many ways the reference um, did remain the same for these watches. However, there were a few notable differences which set these watches apart, and in many ways these were the most successful of the Alaska Project pieces as well, because they had the most use. Because these pieces were released in 1978, and featured the same 42mm twisted lug case as the conventional Speedmaster, except on certain versions, in order to reduce glare, they were fully brushed, in order to, uh, to, to, to really protect the eye and make them more legible to glance. They also took the radial dial from the Alaska Project 2, However, they lost the silver dial and instead kept the, the black dial of previous versions. And this has created really the, the typical aesthetic for these rather understated versions of the Speedmaster, and I think creates a, a unique look, but also a very appealing one. Although interestingly, the tachymeter made its return on these watches, and there was no longer the same crystal protection as seen on the, the previous version. Of course, in some ways, it's unsurprising that Omega were, uh, were able to achieve their goal of putting this ideal space watch in space, 
because really NASA are known for being extremely conservative with regards to their watches and, and their designs, and hence they weren't, very, they weren't very keen on changing the design of something which is already flight tested. But this piece was used in the 1980s during the space shuttle missions, and there is photographic evidence of such use. And so really this watch marked the end of the Alaska project, and indeed Omega's attempts to produce the ultimate space watch from their Speedmaster base. And whilst after this they did continue on to the, the Alaska Project 4, for example, with a, a, a full LCD display, and then they have produced various exclusive models for use in space later on, such as their, their various uh, Annie Digi models, I do feel the Alaska Project marks the end of the, um, the, the early years of wonder, which put the Speedmaster on the map as the ultimate space watch. And so I'll conclude the video there, but do tell me in the comments down below what you, what you thought of the video, and if there were any particular watches or, uh, or details which you found particularly interesting. And so if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to see more content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Alan the Watch Guy, out.